Good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone, wherever in the world you're joining us from. Uh, welcome to Treasure's sixth webinar, um, where we will examine the global supply chain uh, amid the food crisis, the global food crisis at the moment. It's a very relevant topic, um, a relevant topic at the moment. I'm your host, uh, Ben Latigan. I'm a global market analyst uh, here at Tridge. And uh, we have a very diverse group of people joining us from all over the world, from from different time zones. And uh, we're very excited to uh, host you for the for the webinar for the webinar today. Um, before we get going, uh, let's just get some technical some technical uh, issues out of the way. Um, so if we look at the our next slide, um, so for your most optimal viewing experience, we suggest you go to the layout option. Uh, I think it's at the top right and select the side by side view. Then you can see the presenters um, and the panelists and you can see the presentation. And we also have uh, real time translation and transcription services for for English, for Spanish, for French and for German. Um, if I'm correct, that's at the bottom left hand corner. You can click on those closed captions and select the translation option and the, the language that you that you wish to to have the transcription in. Um, and if you need any any technical help throughout the presentation, uh, please use the chat option, and one of the Tridge team members will will assist you um, with any technical issues you might have. Now I'm sure many of you are, are already familiar with Tridge. Just want to tell you a little bit of, more about Tridge before we before we get going with the presentation for today. So Tridge is a leading global sourcing and marketing intelligence platform. And um, in the intelligence and solutions division, uh, we provide qualitative and quantitative data on uh, food and agriculture to provide comprehensive solutions for our clients. And uh, some of the intelligence we provide uh, includes Tridge analysis, local insights, data analysis. We do price data, trade data, and then reports as well. Um, to provide our clients with uh, better decision making skills at the end of the day. Um, if you have any further questions about which uh, which services Tridge provides, please feel free to, to send us an email or reach out in the chat and uh, we will get back to you. So to briefly go over the agenda for today, uh, the webinar will cover, we will examine the, the global supply chain amid the food crisis. And uh, we will have two global market analysts that Eugene will cover the grain supply and trade and uh, one will will cover the vegetable supply and trade. Then we have, we'll have a panel discussion with um, our in global, global engagement managers, which is Renee and, and Dario. And then we will have a question and answer session right at the end to conclude with. Uh, so and if you have any questions during uh, during the webinar, please free, feel free to uh, write them in the chat and we will see if we can answer them in the Q&A session. Otherwise, we will answer them after, after the presentation. So before we get going on the presentation itself, I'm going to ask our two presenters and two panelists to briefly introduce themselves and uh, before we get to our presentation itself. Uh, so I'm your host, uh, Ben Latigan. I'm a global market analyst at Tridge. And I'm going to ask Eugene to introduce him, himself first, and then Juan, and then our two panelists. Good afternoon, good morning, and good day to everyone. My name is Eugene Tomaszewski. I'm a global market analyst responsible for cranes and spices at Twitch. Hello, everyone. I'm Juan Carlos. I cover the, I'm the global market analyst and cover fruit and vegetables for the North American and uh, Central American market at Twitch. Welcome to the webinar. Hello, Hello. folks. I'm Rene Barreto from Brazil, the senior engagement manager in charge of the fulfillment projects for Brazil. I'll be one of your panelists. Welcome, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Dario Palacino. I am an 
engagement manager in Argentina for Twitch. Um, so welcome to this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, thank you. Thank you for our, our presenters and our panelists, our engagement managers. I'm going to give over to Eugene that will give us a presentation on the global grain supply chain um, and its trade and its its impact on the uh, or its yeah its influence on the global food crisis. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, thank you, Ben, for giving me the word uh, one more time. Welcome everyone to this webinar. I would like to cover first of all the grain supply chain and uh, trade and the food shortages in. Uh, in, the, in the global grain market. So uh, before we go on dive in, into the current problem, the current issue, we will review uh, how trade has changed in uh, in grain over the past 20 years. As you can see here the flows of uh, grain on the left hand side is uh, the flows of wheat exports and ex imports uh, of wheat globally and on the right is uh, exports and imports of rice globally. As you can see, uh, trade has become really very interconnected and really global. There are massive flows from, in terms in, in terms of there are massive flows from, from Australia and South America to uh, to Turkey to the Middle East and to uh, Asian countries. The same can be said about uh, Asia. That's about price. There is a lot of trade from that flowing from South Asia and. Uh, Asia to other Asian countries and to North America, and this we can see how flow big the flows are, how trade has become interconnected. So maybe we'll move on further to the global supply issue chain, the grain market. What what has happened? On the next slide, we we can we can see the map with the dependency of uh, different countries and economies on Ukrainian and Russian. Uh, or wheat exports. So uh, before we go in, so we can see that the supply chain has become paralyzed on the first two links: is the resources side and the production side. As we know, and many have experienced, there is little uh, fertilizer supplies in the, on the global scale because of the closure, literally the Russian and Belarusian market who are responsible for potassium and nitrogen fertilizers. And of course, it has jeopardized uh, sowing in uh, for, for wheat, especially, which is so reliant on, uh, on nitrogen fertilizers in South America and in Africa. For example, in Argentina, there's been an evaluation that uh, farmers will use 7% less nitrogen fertilizers. And you can see the difference in prices, $707 that metric done in May on FOB and it was uh, it's twice as much as uh, last year at the same time, but it's slightly less than in April uh, this year. And we can also notice that many developing countries, they cannot afford to switch to other sources except for the Black Sea grain because simply it is cheaper. Uh, uh, the European Union wheat was at the end of May was 445 dollars per ton and the Russian or Ukrainian wheat was 410, 420 dollars per ton. And uh, even if Russia is going to increase production of uh, wheat this year and can ex export more, but Ukraine is, remains block, blocked and it will cause us 5 million tons of a deficit from the export from the Black Sea. If you go further to, to the next slide, so we can see a different picture. In order to prevent uh, uh, the food crisis, uh, there have been 15 countries at least have introduced different bans. Uh, some of them have lifted, like Hungary and Moldova, have just uh, lifted uh, export bans for grains uh, in May. And in Kazakhstan and Egypt have just recently uh, ceased their bans just by yesterday, by the 15th of June. And you can also see a lot of African countries, although they are not the main, the major exporters, but they are pretty uh, significant in the regional trade, especially Ghana uh, and Uganda. They supply, Uganda supplies a lot of corn to Kenya, Tanzania. In 2020-21 season, uh, Uganda supplied 307 metric tons of uh, wheat to its neighbors. And of course, it will paralyze the, uh, the more local scale and regional scale. 
And uh, there is another measure which, which we can see on the on another slide that many countries are introducing as well non-tariff measures that are hindering the supply chain, especially in the export part of it, the logistics part of it. Um, here we can see big producers, Argentina and Russia. Argentina is using export quotas uh, for 2021-22. It's 12 and a half million tons, but what we're interested in for 2022-23 is 10 million. Hopefully it will be increased, but by the end of May, it was 95% full. And in terms of Russia, there is also a quota, 8 million metric tons by the 3rd of June. So, of course, it, it, uh, all these measures are hindering the, the trade process. Now we can go on next to the next slide, please. How about alternatives? Why can other countries buy the, uh, the wheat and corn and other grains? So there are pretty limited number of uh, main exporters and players, 11 players, 12 big exporters. We have already mentioned that the Black Sea grain exports are going to be 5 million tons less than last year. Uh, on the other hand, EU and Canada are going to slightly increase their, their exports, whereas Australia and uh, India, everyone I think have heard about India, that India have introduced a ban uh, instead of uh, exporting 10 million tons, only 4 million tons can be, can be exported. So there is a pretty uh, small number of, uh, of players. And of course, to partially uh, tackle this problem, uh, focus on, on regular regional, regional wheat production, and exports would be a solution partially to it. So we can go on next to the next slide. There have been also a change in the uh, inside the grain supply chain as well, inside of uh, production and supply. Uh, perhaps some, someone have heard that 20% uh, of global wheat supply uh, is used for feed purposes and uh, vice versa for corn. 80% is used for for feed purposes. In 2021, there have been a big change with more countries using uh, feed wheat because it became cheaper. As you can see on the chart, we have uh, uh, one unit unit vector, which means the parity between the feed wheat price and corn price. Of course, since uh, this parity has, has uh, narrowed down, there's been more uh, buying of feed wheat from many countries, including uh, South Korea, especially China, Vietnam, and Thailand. And to temporarily offset lack of wheat and corn on the markets, many Asian countries have begun to buy uh, broken rice, especially from India. Uh, next slide. Nice. Yeah. And another global factor that is uh, affecting the whole uh, supply chain as well, and logistics especially. The weather factor, uh, not a surprise that every year we hear about uh, different uh, various disastrous influence of uh, drought. This year is not an exception. You can look into the French map or the Argentina's map. In France, because of lack of precipitation, 20 to 40% of, of the soil uh, was below average and 40% uh, uh, in Argentina. Argentina during sowing uh, is also the precipitation was 40% lower than the than the Norman Argentina. Of course, it makes farmers switch to other crops that are more heat resistant. And uh, in addition, uh, meteorologists also mentioned about uh, La Nina uh, effect that is going to be 40% uh, back uh, in, during the South American winter. And logistics is also uh, severely affected by. Uh, by high by high costs, as you can see, not so easy to switch to South American corn, for example, uh, corn and uh, wheat for uh, Turkey or for Egypt, uh, because the difference between the logistics cost is at around forty to forty five dollars on metric ton. Next slide, please. And now we can see what's going on on particular examples. Like Turkey is one of the most dependent countries on uh, wheat exports, uh, sorry, wheat imports. And uh, because of good weather conditions, uh, there were some good precipitations early in March, March, April 2022. Uh, local production might increase by 17 to, by the most optimistic forecast, 19 million tons. Of course, it's 2 million metric tons more than last year. 
But despite that, uh, Turkey is still eager to import 10 million metric tons, which is uh, 1 million metric ton more than last year, uh, in last season, because of solid domestic demand and the population is increasing. You can see it on the left chart. How to tackle this problem? Turkey approached uh, two, two ways how to do it. First, uh, there's a diversification of the main partners. Uh, Turkey started to import more from Ukraine before the ports uh, had been shut down. But we can also see an interesting fact about the appearance of Argentina and Brazil. The first uh, in 11 years, uh, Brazil and Argentina supplied uh, uh, wheat to Turkey, but they have already considered how big the trade costs are to, to, de to deliver there. Another measure that the Tur uh, Turkish government is doing is uh, reducing the import tax on, on wheat and some other uh, grains, including oats and including, including barley. Now it has been uh, moved to 0% to tackle inflation. And we have another example. We have Vietnam on the next slide, and we, we can see how it's affecting the corn corn trade. It's uh, Vietnam belongs to the fifth biggest importers of corn. Uh, in 2021-22, it means in the current season, the imports have become lower by one and a half million metric tons. At, at least by the end of the season, is expected to be lower. Uh, why? At the beginning of the season, as we explained, there was more feed wheat uh, imported because it was cheaper than corn. Uh, before lower than the ratio of uh, of one one uh, one unit, and therefore there was more import of uh, feed wheat. And the same as Turkey and Vietnam conver converged to import uh, diversification. So more uh, more corn was bought from Argentina because it's uh, fifteen twenty dollars, usually cheaper than the Brazilian corn. But you can also see some. Uh, the appearance of regional trade patterns. India, instead of 7%, took, uh, took to 15%, and et cetera. So there are, there are more trade increases in the regional scale. And the same as Turkey, there was a reduction in, in the import tax for wheat and for corn. In case of corn, it's from 3% to 0% to make uh, corn less expensive. So from the grain side, uh, that's what uh, we wanted to present, and we, we can continue to our next session to vegetables and fruits. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Juan Carlos to give his presentation on the vegetable supply chain and trade and its effect on the food crisis. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, well, welcome to the vegetables supply chain and trade. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll overview uh, some of the global uh, supply chain constraints in the vegetable sector. Um, contrary to the to the grain sector, uh, the vegetable supply shortages uh, are very uh, indicative to to each specific region or actually particular country. Um, so there's been uh, a few shortages uh, caused by by a few supply chain constraints, but also uh, in terms of production, uh, there's specific vegetables that have uh, decreased their production for a uh, few different reasons. So in in this first uh, slide, we'll, we'll we'll we're showing just an overview of some of the crops that has been more affect, more affected in in in, in the most uh, countries or, or or the majority of countries so the three crops that we have selected and and will overview um, will be potatoes tomatoes and lettuce um, as you can as you can see there in the in the trade flows uh, our potatoes specifically uh, have had a very hard year in terms of production in the main productive countries, uh, and this has affected the, the global supply chain as well. Uh, tomatoes and lettuce uh, are specifically important because they are uh, in in most countries uh, they are greenhouse cultivars. They are greenhouse uh, crops uh, which have been affected as well uh, because of the increase uh, of of uh, the increasing cost of energy. Uh, and labor shortage and some other um, constraints that we have reviewed. So if we go to the next, to the next slide. Uh, so we'll first, uh, before going into each specific crop, I think it's very important for us to 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 see and 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 an overview, have an overview of, of the of what are the main uh, disruptions uh, in, in the supply chain. So there's 
in each specific region, there's different disruption that has been uh, playing on. Uh, some of the main uh, disruptions are shortage of fertilizers and pesticides caused by the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Uh, this is uh, probably a global uh, situation where it not just in root vegetables is seen, but alongside the uh, fruits and other vegetables, uh, the, the, the rising cost of fertilizers has been an issue uh, as well in terms of production. Uh, the rising logistic cost as well that we've been carrying since since COVID last year uh, has also been an issue for the for the supply chain of vegetables. Uh, a labor shortage that also derived from from COVID uh, also also been an issue in terms of production for many crops. Uh, and there are all there are many uh, might all other disruptions that. Have to, have to do a bit more with the weather and with crop failure. Uh, there have been trade, trade restrictions as well. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of countries have uh, imposed restrictions on in import or export of vegetables. We review that as well. Uh, there's a rising cost of natural gas, as I say, and electricity that has has affect uh, greenhouse productions for 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 a few vegetables as well. And last but not least is the ports and border lockdowns that we have seen, especially in the in the conflict uh, in the conflict area with Russia, um, Ukraine, and, and 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 Middle East. So in this map, you can see uh, this is very interesting. How how what what is the region that is more affected in general for all the for all the supply disruptions? Uh, so you can see the northern uh, Africa, uh, Middle East, and 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 this is this is in terms of imports. So this is the the countries that are more being more affected or more impact in in, in terms of vegetable imports. So we we'll go to the if we go to the side. So the 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 countries that have been more more affected in, in terms of 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 imports of vegetables, uh, you can see there in the table. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, you, you can see that how repetitive it is the root and the root vegetables issue, and then in some um, greenhouse crops. So you can see, for example, Russia has uh, has uh, the vegetable commodity that has been an issue for them is potatoes, beets, carrots, cabbage, onions. With a highlight on on potatoes, we will review that as well in, in more detail. Ukraine, of course, uh, because of trade restrictions and rising cost of, of of electricity and ports and border lockdowns, has also been an issue. Uh, and then you, we have different uh, countries in different regions that, because of similar problems, they have disruptions as well. So, in the case of potatoes, for example, uh, U.S. and Canada have uh, have had all through the last couple of years have problems with drought, so they have declined their, their, their production, uh, causing disruptions as well. Uh, India, for example, uh, there's been uh, huge problems about labor shortage. Uh, also, the fertilizer and pesticides cost have affected the Indian crops as well, such as onion, tomatoes, potatoes, and lettuce. Uh, UK, as I've mentioned, uh, they've been affected, uh, severely affected into their domestic production uh, in terms of greenhouse because of the rising cost of, of, of electricity. Um, and Australia uh, had, had a major uh, lettuce uh, shortage this this year because of crop failure and, and labor shortage as well caused, caused by COVID. So if we go to the next slide, um, I think we'll we'll review here the disruption on exporting countries. So so the first map that I show you was the the the, the, the affected countries uh, in terms of imports. Uh, but of course there's there's been uh, several uh, countries affected by in in their exports as well. Um, and this is mainly because of trade uh, blockage or trade restrictions that uh, have been imposed to these countries. Of course, Russia and Ukraine uh, are, are some of them, uh, but also Algeria, Egypt, Turkey, Kazakhstan, and Indonesia uh, are, are are countries that have had restrictions, strong restrictions in terms of uh, exports. Now, it's important to mention that some of these countries have imposed themselves these these, these export restrictions uh, to curb the prices uh, of vegetables in, in in their own in their own in their own country in their own markets. So we go to the next we go to the next slide. Uh, we'll talking about trade restrictions. We'll we'll have a look more specific into which trade trade restrictions have affected. Uh, the most and, and have been more relevant uh, this year or, or since last, some of them even since last year. So there's been an, an, an Iranian ban uh, uh, for, 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 for a few countries, India, Russia, Uzbekistan, Emirates, uh, Oman and Qatar have 
impose a trade restriction of 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 of, of vegetables from Iran, which has affected uh, Iran in, in in a strong way. Um, Tunisian exports have been banned as well. Um, Botswana imports. The government of Botswana. This is one of the countries that has a self-imposed an, an, an export ban to curb the prices in, in their own country, uh, as well as uh, Morocco. Mor Morocco in, in in a few crops, but tomato is one of them. Uh, Turkish uh, vegetables have also been banned from, from, from a few countries. Uh, Bangladesh, Emirates and Sri Lanka have banned the, the export of Turkish uh, uh, vegetables. And, and Lebanon has, has also imposed an, a ban on processed vegetables. Uh, and, and, and Middle East countries that normally buy, buy processed vegetables from Lebanon have been, have been also affected. Um, Okay. Yeah, yes. Can we go to the to the next slide then? Thanks. Okay. So let's take a look uh, specifically to two two specific crops, uh, the potato and the and the tomato, which are, in terms of uh, how they've been impacting prices, uh, I think they're the most relevant. So, for example, uh, the the global potato shortage. Uh, there's different uh, different situations that have aligned uh, for 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 now for us to be in a global potato shortage now again that this doesn't mean that nowhere in the world uh, has has potato if there's a potato shortage there are specific countries that uh, rely on imports or rely on domestic production and now they are facing a, a, a potato shortage so this such is the case as ukraine russia us canada um to name a few so, for example, the the pricing the price of potatoes uh, in the beginning of the year in the U.S. has raised forty six percent year on year, uh, which is uh, for 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 a, for a crop that is so consumed and so sellable in the U.S. It's a huge increase, uh, and this response to the as you can see in the graph to the a decrease over and over from since 2018 the u.s have been decreasing uh, since uh, their 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 potato production and this is due mainly to uh, the droughts that they have suffered in specific regions um then for example uh, russia has decreased uh, their 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 production as well and this is due to that the, they have in general decreased their harvest area of potatoes and they have kept decreasing throughout the year. So they are relying more on, on, on imports uh, from, from different countries, uh, especially from, from Europe as well. Uh, and of course, with the, with the trade restriction on Russia right now, well, of course, they are facing now a, a, a shortage of potatoes in this specific crop. What are the implications on this? Well, um, the... Russia uh, and and it has to it, it will start uh, as soon as as soon as it's able to to do it to import more potatoes from other countries and then we will see also another policies may might change for example in the U.S. Uh, where the potato industry is really protected and really there's no market access for other suppliers uh, but there's already talks about uh, allowing uh, other suppliers of, of potatoes uh, into the market to alleviate that uh, that increase in, in prices so i think uh, as well as in other crops but potato i think is the best example we're gonna start seeing a uh, market access policies uh, in these specific countries in order to alleviate this this shortage uh, so if you go to the next slide so in in terms of so the, this is the other um crop that will review in the tomato production shortage and the rising cost so this is in a way similar to the to the to the potato in terms of that there are a few countries that have um that have decreased their production, but in terms of tomato, the problem, the bigger problem here is that it's been is beginning to be more expensive to produce tomato in a few countries, especially the the countries that are focused on greenhouse tomatoes, um, and in different few varieties that are producing greenhouse, uh, they are facing, a, a, for example, U.S., Spain, Greece, Portugal, and France uh, have exceeded a three-year average price levels, so. On all of these specific countries and key productive countries in Europe, um, the cost of production of producing tomatoes have uh, increased uh, substantially, and this has, of course, uh, in general, increased the market price in of tomatoes, especially in, for example, in UK, uh, 
Uh, they've seen a 60% increase year on year, Turkish uh, 90%, and Spanish tomatoes has increased 30% as well. Uh, pretty much all of them uh, comes from uh, more expensive production inputs, a rising cost on different different agricultural inputs, as well as uh, economic, uh, as in, so, such in the case of Turkey, uh, they're one of the reasons is also the economic inflation that this uh, economies or these countries have suffered, which has, doesn't help in, in prices as well. So one of the things here, for example, tomato processors uh, are already seeing an unprecedented prices for fresh tomatoes. So tomato processors are really uh, paying a little bit the price on 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 these issues. They are uh, their product their production cost will be. Uh, definitely more important, and in the right, uh, we we can see a little bit of the logistic or supply disruptions that that we're gonna see or that we're already seeing. So, for example, uh, the UK that normally uh, imports more uh, more tomatoes from from Netherlands, from Spain, so so specific countries in 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 Europe, they are. Uh, there's a trend about uh, shifting uh, suppliers on these type of crops. Uh, so they they are increasing their imports from Morocco, from Poland, from Portugal uh, instead of the usual um, suppliers in in Europe, such as Spain, Italy, the Netherlands. Uh, and in the case of Turkey, for example, in 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 terms of exports, um, because of the issues they've been having uh, and because of other uh, restrictions, supply chain restrictions, they have de they have been decreasing their their in their exports to Russia, Romania, Ukraine, which are usually their their their, their usual customers. Uh, but they have been increasing their 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 imports, their exports, sorry, to more uh, profitable markets that are willing to pay higher price for their products, such as Germany and, and, and Israel. Um, so I think that will be it for vegetables. Um, ben, thank you. Thank you very much to Eugene and to Juan Carlos for those very insightful presentations. Uh, we will be moving over to the panel discussion. Uh, again, if you have any questions uh, during throughout the presentation, throughout the panel discussion, uh, feel free to put them in the chat and we will see if we can get to them in the question and answer session or we can answer them directly in the chat. All right, the first question uh, of the panel discussion is uh, what are some short and long term consequences of this uh, food crisis? Okay. Uh... Hello, everyone. Thanks, uh, Eugene and uh, Juan Carlos for your presentation. As it was well said by everyone, uh, I would like to add a few more comments. Uh, this is the worst food crisis since 2008. The number of interacting factors this time are way more diverse. It started with the pandemic, followed by uh, port congestions and port lockdowns. Um, sea freight prices rise, and then we had extreme weather issues, and on and on. So uh, this time, the consequences uh, of this food crisis are also are tending to be way uh, more deeper than we uh, faced in 2008. So for the short term, uh, obviously, we are seeing prices rising and supply disruption, especially because of the Russia and Ukrainian war. Uh, we all know that both countries supply a large amount of the world trade of wheat, around 28%, and also 18% of corn. Uh, so those countries which are uh, depending on those two uh, grains, they will have to find um, new alternatives. We will see a shift of uh, demand. Probably there will be an increase of rice consumption as well as cassava and some other products that can, that has a potential to substitute those um, two main crops. So the price rising will be seen across the <clears throat> the the grains and substitute products uh, in sequence there will be an expansion of famine especially on the developing countries which can lead in the long term 
to civil uprising and political instability. We all know what led the Arab Spring uh, uprisings in the past. Some of the issues were the, besides the corruption, the increase of prices of food items. Uh, that will also lead us to a change in world trade, as it was already uh, shown by Eugene. Uh, we will see again a staple food shift, uh, change of habits, uh, acceleration of uh, trade agreements between countries, lowering of uh, trade barriers, while some other countries are creating uh, export barriers uh, as well, and uh, most likely expansion of local agricultural policies. This is uh, how I see it for the short and the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Thank you for, for that. Uh, if we move on to the next question. Sorry, I, I want to add some comments uh, to, to, to this. Ben, yes, I, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, go sorry. ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, it is very interesting what my colleague René commented. Uh, I would like to, to add um, other consequences related to this food crisis. Um, in 2021, uh, 193 million people suffer uh, food insecurity, uh, 40 million more than the previous year. It is expected that in 2022, the situation will worsen due to inflation in the price of food, and 50 million people could be added to this number. It is a very worrying number uh, to analyze. Um, when the prices of basic food increase, uh, the families with the lowest resources begin to spend all or most of their budget on food instead of health, education, recreation, etc. In addition, in other sectors of society having lower incomes, they begin to consume lower quality food. Um, and another thing is that we can mention to the migration, that is a collateral effect uh, of food insecurity. Uh, the loss of the purchasing power of households due to the pandemic and inflation in food prices, uh, extreme weather events, level of insecurity in certain ter uh, territories, among others, are factors that are, are interrelated, mutually reinforcing and influencing in the decisions that family makes to abandon their homes and lands, searching for work um, or help. Um, that is the, my my comment. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Renee and Dario. Uh, let's move on to to the next question. Um, when can we expect the situation to calm down or the food crisis to start resolving and uh, things to return to normal, if that will ever happen? This is a real tricky one. Um, well. Uh, obviously, when the Russia and Ukrainian war ends, uh, things, things may start to come down. Uh, although the COVID pandemic uh, is becoming softer, it's not totally behind us yet, so it still affects. We are now talking about new lockdowns in Shanghai and Beijing. Uh, and uh, also, uh, when the global container flow resumes its pre-pandemic patterns, which will probably uh, take long, uh, we have uh, been aware that there will be more vessels, new vessels uh, and new containers uh, are expected to be launched between 2023 and 2024. So I don't think this crisis, this uh, food crisis will be over before the next two years. We have to be prepared to face it for quite a long time. Yes, um, 
I agree, uh, isn't it? Uh, it is not such an easy question to answer since there are many variables that uh, could calm the situation or worsen it in view of the coming months and, and years. Um, uh, for the moment, high prices could only stabilize uh, around 2023, but they will remain at high levels until 2024, according to the World Bank estimates. Um, uh, for example, uh, the famous container crisis could begin to relieve a bit in 2023. Uh, several container uh, ships will be delivered to shipping companies uh, over the next year as part of a strategic purchases made post pandemic. Um, as for food, we must wait for the results of this year's harvest uh, and those to come. Since the, since the lack of inputs and, and the increase in price uh, can threaten final results and therefore the supply of grain, fruits and other products. Um, all this will depend on the factors that we mentioned uh, earlier. What, weather conditions, the war in Russia and Ukraine, the decisions and blockades that derive from this conflict and the decisions that international organizations take to alleviate this situation. From the side of controllable uh, variables, it will depend on coordinated actions being carried out between the different world entities that can take action to calm the situation, as government, private companies, and all those actors related to the food supply chain at the global level. Um, the actions to be carried, uh, I think, the out, um, should not only be about putting out the fire, uh, but should also be about being prepared for the next crisis or preventing them from happening. Thank you, thank you, Dario. Dario, while you are um, while you're busy answering, while you're at the word, uh, do you mind answering uh, taking the third question first? Um, what are the potential ways to alleviate the the shortages, uh, the food shortages that we are experiencing? Okay, thank you. Um, First of all, um, if the conflict between Russia and Ukraine ends and the threat coming from this region is released again, the global prices of several products, such as grains, oil, fertilizers, and fuels, uh, should stabilize and decrease, maybe. Uh, we need to, to recover the, norm, the normal supply of um, these products, ensure access for small farmers and, uh, for example, for fertilizers and control supplies anywhere for the next uh, two years, I think, to get the global supply mechanics back on track. Also, we need to, to give support to the, um, to the food and agriculture organization proposal to create a, finance, a financing uh, mechanism uh, for food imports that helps uh, is the immediate food import financing costs. Uh, eligible, eligible are food importing countries uh, in low income and lower middle income groups of the World Bank income classification. Um, um, a very important point in what each one uh, of us can contribute uh, is this. Uh, a third of food is wasted in the world. We must develop ways to make this number smaller and smaller. 25% uh, of that waste could feed uh, 900 million people. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very informative information, Dario. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the very few alternatives uh, depend uh, mainly on public policies. Uh, one of them is the reduction of uh, trade barriers, which is already in place in some countries, uh, but also the acceleration of uh, free trade agreements with new partners. Um, next, the encouragement of local production of staple foods and uh, which comes together with inducing changes in habits, replacing mainly wheat and corn by other crops. For instance, uh, in Sudan, most of the bread is made of sorghum and not uh, wheat. 
Uh, sorghum goes well in most of uh, African countries. So there, there, there is a potential to, uh, to uh, give uh, incentive to small farmers uh, to produce sorghum and cassava uh, and rice uh, in some countries that are currently uh, depending of the supply of, surg of uh, wheat and corn. So uh, that's the only way I see to alleviate the potential shortages. But then uh, those public policies, so we know they don't, uh, normally governments act uh, slowly before taking those measures. And those would have to be taken immediately if we want to alleviate it. That's it. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And uh, thank you, Dario. So that's it for our panel discussion. Um, we very insightful answers there. We'll be moving over to our Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much for all your questions in the chat. If you have any more, please continue with them. Uh, those that we don't get to today, we will follow up in an email afterwards. Uh, for our first question, um, how will a food crisis affect developing countries? Um, we're seeing in, in Africa, for example, uh, big uh, the food crisis popping up in a lot of countries that rely on, on imports. So how will a food crisis affect developing countries? Okay, I'll start again. Um, here. Uh, most of it has been already said, developing countries will have to compete with developed nations for the same products. And obviously that price will dictate the destination of those products. Um, additionally, shipping companies tend to focus their ships and containers on more profitable routes. We are already witnessing these uh, changes. Uh, some routes have been uh, uh, cut from their schedule. Uh, so the uh, many nations will face cost pressures. Uh, and those nations are likely to be more uh, vulnerable, uh, uh, having to face a major shift in staple foods, as I mentioned before. So there will be definitely a change uh, on people's uh, habits. As Dario uh, said very well, uh, people will, you know, people of lower income will tend to uh, decrease the quality uh, of their um, food. So there, is, there will be a reflection um, on their health as well. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there is a strong uh, potential of civil unrest, civil uprising, and political instability, especially on the developing countries. This is it. Uh, thank you. Um, anybody have something to add to that question? I'll probably add to that question as well. Uh, so in terms of food shortages, uh, what consequences for the developing countries? Uh, we have already mentioned many, many other things which I wanted to add. Of course, it's to, to try to, to improve, to, to, to try to sign more contracts with the other suppliers and big ones like uh, African countries could rely more on buying more grain from Bulgaria or Romania. We still have a bit of supply to be uh, to be secured and it's possible and uh, what how about uh, consequences uh, we know there is a Pareto principle principle as well in economics uh, which which would mean that for example for western countries when income increases so the percentage of uh, the share of uh, income used for spending on, on food decreases but for uh, for developing countries this is really difficult to apply because we know that uh, because of high inflations the income are diminishing which which means that automatically the share of spending on on food is going to increase 
which which means that this opportunity cost will be uh, cannot be used for something else that they can enjoy. They can, they can enjoy. They can they need will need to forego something to to get more food to 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 survive because we know that uh, grain, in particular wheat and uh, corn, are considered as more um, inelastic commodities, which are relatively difficult to 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 be replaced or to decrease income also. It's like for as Rene said about the about sorghum, which is a great uh, substitute and has worked in, in many African countries, and now it's been uh, grown uh, in a big in a big massive way in Argentina and the United States and Australia. So that's what I wanted to uh, to add. Thank you. I I want to add a, a comment uh, about this. This question. Um, in the first half of 2022, uh, 90% uh, of emerging countries experienced increases of 5% or more in fruit product prices. Um, most uh, low resource uh, countries are mostly food importers. Uh, this crisis uh, fully um, affects them. Since the general increase in basic food products means that fewer and fewer people can access uh, these foods. Um, this also taking into account that we were recovering from a pandemic where the world stopped and affected the economies of these countries. In June, uh, the agricultural price index is 40% more expensive than in January 2021. In addition, um, as we mentioned earlier, these situations with food can lead to political crises, mass migrations, wars, among, um, among other social conflicts. Um, the countries have to, to create uh, training plans and, and need to promote family farming uh, or on a smaller scale, sustainable, which allows to ensure parts of the food of the most uh, vulnerable sectors. We have to, to think uh, about producing more food, but in a sustainable way, uh, affecting the environment as little as possible. Uh, this must be on the agenda of all countries uh, and coordinated actions uh, must uh, be carried out looking towards the future. Um, uh, rela uh, resolutions related to time and uh, aimed at ensuring the efficient functioning of world markets uh, and the commitment to keep world trade in food products free from unjustified trade barriers, increase uh, solidarity, uh, solidarity with the most vulnerable countries and increase uh, sustainable local food production. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the answers to that question. <coughs> Sorry. So um, crisis always brings opportunity. What are ways that suppliers can, uh, or are there, uh, how can suppliers penetrate new markets amid this food crisis? Or uh, does the crisis come with opportunities uh, for penetrating new markets for suppliers and exporters? I should uh, start again. Sorry, Dario. Yes, uh, please, please go ahead. Thank you, Ben. Um, uh, this crisis that we are talking about um, uh, revealed the fragility of the system as a whole. Um, when a small part of the mechanism fails, problems occur throughout the chain. Since each of its actors uh, is um, interrelated. In each of these links, uh, there may be opportunities for suppliers uh, to meet demands uh, for products or services in places that they might not have reached before, or in destinations that would never have been competitive for, for production costs uh, or logistics costs uh, uh, and other things. Um, in addition, uh, this situation may be possible to see which products are essential and in the event of any failure in the global supply chain system, they may be missing in the world. Um, and this 
also opens uh, the door to rethink, for example, that in the future, other types of, for example, fertilizers can be developed uh, that do not come mostly for a single region to mitigate the risk that in the face of a political conflict, it uh, will impact the global supply chain. This is also related uh, to the supply uh, of energy and how existing alternative sources can be developed in the future or new ones created, as long as their positive impact is greater than the negative for the environment, to mention it. Um, many important countries were able to discover um, other markets from which to obtain supplies and thus have supply alternatives. In the short term, each allowed uh, countries or suppliers that had product in stock and that were able to maintain their production and host supply fell due to the pandemic or the armed conflict to obtain extraordinary profits in these months when there was an extraordinary demand for, for example, for sunflower oil, poultry, fertilizer, among our other products. In addition, this crisis will how uh, fragile is the global logistics system in the face of a pandemic or, say, or certain political conflicts. So it may be an opportunity for companies in the, in the industry to rethink certain operational and commercial, and commercial strategies. For example, as we mentioned before, shipping companies. Uh, but we must not think that it is only to increase the production of certain basic products. We must also um, focus on making this production sustainable and friendly to the environment so that the negative effects are not greater than the positive ones. Thank you. Um, I would like to add um, a quick comment on that. I, I agree with Ario. I think it's very, very interesting what he said. I would add that uh, for in order to be to 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 solve these issues in a sustainable way, as as he as he mentioned on his last bit, uh, of course, with every crisis, uh, not just in the food industry, with every crisis there are opportunities. Uh, in in the short term, of course, there are going to be suppliers that are willing to supply a product that is or or a specific crop that is in shortage in a specific region and a specific market. But I think that this crisis, in particularly calls for a, or, or should call for a more sustainable uh, uh, practice in terms of technological uh, innovations. So, for example, there are, there are a lot of uh, innovations coming, such as smart farming, uh, urban farming, um, uh, platform technological platforms such as Twitch, for example, that uh, try to uh, do a more direct trade. Uh, you know, so I think this crisis, in a way, uh, of course, it, it will it will solve uh, in a short term. Uh, uh, there, it, there could be short term opportunities for different suppliers and buyers, but in a, in a long term and in a more sustainable way, um, you, in a way that the, the way uh, we are being we have been dealing with the with the supply chain system, this crisis has uh, has has uh, has let us look that maybe the way we are trading uh, traditional commodities. Uh, is not necessarily the way we should be doing the doing it in the in the long term. You know, there there are there are. I think we need to be aware of more technological and and, and sustainable solutions in in the long run as well. Uh, thank you very much. Um, there's one last question I quickly want to take uh, from the chat. I can uh, can answer it myself. Uh, Niaz asked, um, how does climate change affect food security in, in Pakistan and India? Um, so India has experienced very unseasonable uh, weather uh, with heavy rains in, in late last year in October and then heat waves at the start of this year, uh, coupled with, with some more rains. Um, I recently had a look at um, mango production in Pakistan and India and the expectation is that Mango production will be down roughly 50% 50, 50 in, in both of those countries. That will mean a reduction from 24 million metric tons to 12 million metric tons in India and um, 1.8 million metric tons in Pakistan down to 900,000 uh, metric tons. That's just for mangoes. 
um, the expectation is that it, you'll have a similar situation with other crops that are that are in season in, in, in this time. So it'll definitely have an impact on on food security. Um, so that's all we have time for today um, with regards to questions. I want to thank our presenters, Eugene and Juan Carlos, uh, very much for very insightful presentations. And then Renee and Dario, our panelists, um, for uh, for great insights into our, our our panel discussion. So thank you every, everyone for for your for your contribution. Um, if you have any further questions, please feel feel free to reach out to us at intelligence-solutions at tridge.com. Um, so to wrap up this webinar for today, um, the COVID nineteen situation. Um, has caused some instability in, 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 in the global food trade, um, especially with regards to the logistics side and the war in Ukraine um, with Russia and Ukraine involved um, has only made the situation worse. And we're not seeing a, an, an easy way of solving this or a quick way of, of getting out of this food crisis. But there are innovative solutions and ways um, and opportunities to, to exploit in this time. And that's where Tridge can can help its clients and um, and can help you. So please feel free to reach out to us. Um, yeah, if you have any further questions, ask them in the chat or or follow up with an email uh, with us. And then this presentation, the video format, and the slides will be available and sent to everyone um, that registered for this uh, for this webinar. So thank you everyone for for your attendance and your time. Um, I hope it was insightful and. Uh, and informative.